Would you take God's word this morning, please, and open to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at uh, verse 25 on down. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God help us as we listen to the word of God today. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you will bless us as we go to the Scripture. Lord, as we think about this mystery that the Apostle Paul refers to of the church and our relationship to the church, Lord, just direct us in our thoughts, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we live in a culture today that is afraid of commitment. In fact, many couples think, why get married? Why not just live together for a while and see if it all works out? Many people have the same idea with regard to membership in a church. They think, why join a church? Why not just go to the church and check it out? And I mean, what's the point of joining a church? And in fact, there are some churches out there that don't even have really formal membership. They basically say, if you attend, you're, you're a member. And besides that, a lot of people will say, you know, we've been burnt out with church. Perhaps they got involved at a church at one point somewhere, and they somehow they were hurt by something or uh, maybe a false rumor that was spread about them. Or maybe they started going to a church and uh, the pastor that was there in some way disappointed them in something that he did or that he said. And so to avoid a lot of that unnecessary conflict, they just don't join a church at all. And they say, you know, having a personal relationship with Jesus, that's, that's, that's one thing. I mean, we want to do that, but getting involved in the church, that's another. Besides that, you know, people think, I want to keep my weekends open. I don't want to get tied down. And so all of these factors have led to um, this current trend that I think is very unhealthy today, and that is for people just to not really be a part of a church or to maybe find some kind of substitute for the church or maybe just meet with a few people in the house together and call it church. And now here, even more recently, we have, we have COVID, which gives some people a legitimate reason why they should not really get tied down into an assembly of church. And so they think, you know, if I need spiritual nourishment, I'll, I'll, you know, after all, you can go online now. You can get sermons online. You can hear preachers online that are a whole lot better than that guy down there at Grace. <laughs> and so they don't really make church a part of their life. We've been talking about, uh, for the past few months, uh, a series called Spiritual Disciplines. This will probably be the last sermon I do in that series. But spiritual disciplines, if you've been with us, you know that what that means is spiritual disciplines are godly habits that we practice in our life that help us in this area of becoming more like Christ. It's godly habits that produce godly character. These are things that we have to have as a part of our life. And the, the, the text verse that we've used for this is 1 Timothy 4, 7, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That is, exercise yourself rather unto godliness. It takes discipline, and you have to put these disciplines in your life. Just like an athlete that's competing for a prize, you must discipline yourself. You must exercise yourself. And Paul's using that athletic metaphor to apply to the Christian life. And so spiritual disciplines are these, these exercises, these things that we enact in our life that produce godliness. And we've looked at the discipline of Scripture, 
and the discipline of prayer and the discipline of worship and confession and forgiveness and giving and discernment and service. Today, I want us to consider the discipline of church membership. And in this sermon, I'm going to argue this. This is the main idea. To be an obedient Christian, you must go beyond just church attendance to being a committed member, committed serving member of a local church. Now, as we read our passage here in Ephesians, Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Think about that. Since Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, if we love Christ, we're going to have to do the same thing. We have to have that same kind of commitment. So I want us to consider today just four ideas. I'm going to talk about the concept, the causes, the candidates, and then finally the commitment of church membership. First of all, think about with me the concept of church membership. Now, some people argue that the concept of church membership is not in the Bible. I've heard people talk about that. But what I want to just, just briefly demonstrate to you is that it clearly is in the Bible. In Sunday school, during the 945 hour, I've been going through a series called Membership Matters, and I've been talking about some of these issues, but I gave a definition there, and I want to give it again here. This is the definition of a church. The local church is a gathering of those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, who are committed to meet regularly for worship, teaching, fellowship, and prayer, and who will help make disciples of all people. Now, the key in that whole definition is the word committed. The picture of a Christian being committed to a local gathering of believers, that's biblical. That's in the New Testament. They're gathered together. They're committed to Christ. They're committed to one another. They serve the Lord. They're actively involved in each other's lives. That's a New Testament concept. And this is a a concept that we see, again, in the Scripture. The Bible talks about this. You're in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 15. Notice what Paul says there. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, in love. And that's just what Paul is saying there is that just he's kind of comparing the church again to the body, a human body, just like there's no useless parts in the human body. I mean, even the appendix serves as a function. Even so, there are no useless members in the body of Christ. Every member has an important function and is to work for the overall growth and good and strength of the body. Now, again, some people will say, well, we don't find this concept of church membership in the New Testament. Well, beloved, it's there. It's implied all through the New Testament. Now, we may not, it may not be formalized the way we do it today. That's because there was only one church per city. If you were living back in that day and you lived in the city of Ephesus, you went to the church at Ephesus, there was only one church there. Today, here in America, we have dozens of churches in our cities I pastored a church down in Tennessee before I came here. I live five minutes away from that church. I passed five churches on the way to my church. And and they were all big churches. I called it the land of the giants because they were all big churches. In fact, the church that I pastored, we had 2,500 members in that church. But don't let that impress you. Half of those members I couldn't find if I hired the FBI which tells me that they really didn't understand the concept of membership in a church. And down there, people would just float around. They were like migratory birds. If they were in one church and the pastor said something that offended them, no problem, they just went to another church. I even had people come to me and say, Pastor, if you don't do this, I'm going to leave. And, uh, and they would leave, you know. Um, and, and they would float around. They were like migratory birds just going from one church to another to another, and finally they would make the circuit, and then a year later they'd come back in our church again. Again, that shows that there's no real biblical understanding of what it is to be a part of a church. And so being a true disciple of Jesus, following him, means that you want to be a part of the body of Christ. And it's not all about you. It's all about others. It's not only serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's serving and loving others. Now, there are many passages in the New Testament that infer the idea of 
membership in a local church. For example, this idea begins to take shape in Matthew 16, and then later in Matthew 18. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church. And then in Matthew 18, Jesus is talking to his about the process of church discipline. Listen to what he says in Matthew 18, verse 17. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now, it's obvious from that verse that a person who's being confronted about an issue knew who the people in the church were. I mean, how can you tell it to the church if they're not committed to being together? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 to 13, Paul commanded the Corinthians to expel a member. A member was doing wrong. They were sinning unrepentantly. And Paul said, look, get rid of them. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 12. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. What Paul's doing there is he's talking about the difference between those who are within and those who are without. Those who are within are people who are members of that church. Again, that implies membership. They knew who they were. They had a group together. They knew who the members were. And those who were members were those who were within. Paul said it's not our job to cast judgment on sinners who are outside the church. That's not, we don't do that. But we are accountable to one another in the church to help each other out, to provoke one another to good works. And so here he is inferring to members about membership. The Apostle John said the same thing in 1 John 2.19. He said this, they went out from us but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. It is obvious that everyone knew who us was there. Again, this was the members of the church. And we just took the Lord's Supper in, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talking about the Lord's Supper, he said this, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it. That statement implies that there was a definite group that came together as the church. And many times you see in 1 Corinthians 11, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. This was, the church was a group of people that came together regularly for worship. We see this concept all throughout the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, Peter got up and he preached, and the Bible says that 3,000 souls were added. Well, how do you add to something unless you're not an organized body in some way? They counted the numbers. They knew the names. They had a role there of those that were added to the church. And so the life of the church wasn't just a matter of, just come when you can. This was a defined, recognized group of people who believed in Jesus Christ, who repented of their sin, who became believers. They were baptized. They were added to the number of people there in that assembly. They knew one another. In fact, the Bible says in Acts 4.32, they were of one heart and of one soul. They were together. They were one. And we can go on and on all through the book of Acts. After Paul's first missionary journey, he gathered together the church. It says in Acts 14, 27, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, how he opened up the door of faith unto the Gentiles. There again is the church coming together. Why? To report all that God was doing out there on the mission field. Again, this implies membership, a, a church. Paul paints a picture of the church as a holy temple. Listen to Ephesians 2.19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. He's comparing there the body of Christ to a temple. And the temple, the foundation is Christ. And guess what? We are the living stones, and we're put into that temple. We're like stones in a temple, but we're living stones. You ever see a temple where the bricks were just independent laying everywhere? No, they were cemented together. That's the image there of a church. They were committed, built together into one structure. And and no one I can go, but I want to for the sake of time, go to the second idea, and that is the causes of church membership. We see the concept. It's clearly in the Bible. But secondly, the causes. Why should we join a church? 
This is the question I want to answer there. Why do I want to join a local church? Well, let me just give you some reasons biblically. First of all, to demonstrate the life-changing power of the gospel in your life. That's why you do that. Those who are believers, those who are truly saved, they want to be with God's people. You know why? Because when you're a believer now, there's just this natural, I should say supernatural love that God puts in your heart, and you have this love for everyone else that are believers. So you love being together in the church. John said it like this, 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. That is to say, if you really love God, you're going to love all those that are also born of God. That means all of you all. If I'm truly a child of God, I'm going to love all his other children. That's called family love. And I love being together with God's people. In fact, that's the evidence that you are a true child of God. Do you have a love in your heart for other believers? Which means you're going to love the church. Now, some people, they, they say the words, to dwell above with the saints I love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints I know, well, brother, that's another story. And honestly, at times it's challenging in the church. We have to be forgiving. We have to be forbearing. After all, what are we? We're all sinners who have been forgiven by the grace of God. And just like in any family, we all have our own little issues. We all have our own baggage that we're bringing in. And guess what? All of us, we're being conformed to the image of Christ. And he's working on us, which means we have to love one another. And we have to forgive one another. And we have to be forbearing And yet with the church, with all of its flaws, is still the place that we love because we are the children of God. John the Beloved, who wrote uh, 1 John in the book of Revelation, for a time he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Tradition says that when he was finally released and he was brought back to Ephesus and they were bringing him in on a stretcher because he was so aged, that as they brought him in, he said over and over again, oh, the fellowship of the saints. You know why? Because that's the thing that he missed. He missed being together with the saints of God. Mark Dever wrote in his book, membership is the natural outcome of the gospel itself. And if you're passionate about the gospel, one of the primary ways you show that is to be part of a local church, is to join and be a part of that body. Now, this was demonstrated in my life by my father. You know, growing up, we weren't church people. We, we never went to church. Um, my father, when he got saved, I remember very distinctly when that happened. I was 14 years old at the time. My dad came here to Grace Bible Baptist Church. He heard Pastor Johnson preach. Uh, up until that point in my life, I'd only seen my dad in a suit one other time before that time he went to Grace. It was at a funeral. And then I saw him one Sunday dress up in a suit. And my first thought was, who died? But no one did. He went to grace. He got saved. And you know what happened was there was this dramatic transformation in his life. And I would go by his room, and he would be on his knees reading his Bible. And he was just a different man. Every time, um, uh, you know, we would go to church. uh, The pastor would say, we need this. Dad would volunteer for it. We were in church after that Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If something needed to be done, Dad would volunteer for it. Sometimes he'd volunteer me for it. He didn't ask me about that. And so that's the way it was. I was thinking, who is this man? He's not the same person. But you know what? The transformation of the gospel is, is demonstrated in the, your relationship to the body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We join the church because it is a natural outgrowth of the gospel, but also to demonstrate the world to the world our love and our oneness. Jesus said this, the world will know that you're my disciples for, by the love that you have for one another. That's how the world knows that we're different. In Sunday school, we've been studying the church, and one of the metaphors used is the body of Christ. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into the body of Christ. But there's a passage I want you to look at. Look in Colossians chapter 3 and look down at verse number 9. And notice what it says here. Actually, we'll look at verse 10. Colossians 3 verse 10. Just turn there. I want you to see this. 
Because the Bible says this in verse 10, and having put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And I love that verse. You know what Paul's teaching here? It's this idea that the church is the body of Christ. And you know what he calls it? He calls it the new man. I call this to Adam theology. You know why? Because when God looks down from heaven, he only sees two men. And everyone in the world, you're either in one of these two. You're either in the old Adam, and the Bible says in Adam all die. You know why? Because when Adam sinned, we were all in him, and all those that are in Adam, they die in their sin. But you know what happens at salvation? We're taken out of Adam and we're placed in the new Adam or the new man, which is Christ. So I can divide people here up in this this room up into just two groups. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're in the new man. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know what happens? You're in the new man. And what's the result of that? Notice again in verse 11 where there's neither Jew or excuse me, Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. What's he basically saying there? That now that you're in the body of Christ, all the the, the sinful man-made barriers that man has put up, they're all ripped away. They're ripped away. What kind of barrier? Racial barriers, Greek nor Jew. You think racism runs deep in our country? It's nothing to compare to what it was like in the ancient world between Jews and between Gentiles. Jews would never enter into a Greek home. It was considered unclean. They would eat food only cooked by uh, Jews. They wouldn't eat food cooked by Gentiles. When they re-entered into the land of Palestine, they would shake off the Gentile dust before they entered in. I mean, racism running deep there. But you know what happened? When the gospel was preached, that barrier was ripped down. And you know what the ancient world saw? And it shocked them, it surprised them. They saw Jews and Gentiles worshiping together in the same place, loving one another the way you're supposed to love one another. And it didn't matter whether you were, it was a racial barrier or it was a cultural barrier, barbarian, Scythian, a barbarian was considered someone of low uh, society, Um, whether it was bond or free. Bond was someone who was a slave or a free man. Slavery was still part of the ancient world, and they were considered lower on the society of totem pole. But yet when you came to Christ and you came into that new man, all those things were ripped away, and you know what? There was total oneness in Jesus Christ. You know what the world world's trying to do today? The world's trying to put everybody in compartments, and it's trying to separate everyone. But you know what the gospel does? The gospel rips away all that. And the gospel brings us all together. And you know what? We're called the new man because we are one. We are corporately in the body, and we are in Christ. And we have this love one for another. And Christ is all, and Christ is in all. That's why there's total unity. It doesn't matter what your ethnical background is or your social background is. When you come to the church, to the body of Christ, you're truly saved. You are one in him. Absolutely one. There's total equality there in Christ. Mark Devers writes this, Christ has destroyed our hostility one toward another. In Christ, God's people have peace and are reconciled into one body. But here's another reason why you should become part of the church, to place yourself under spiritual shepherds who care for you, who will give account for your soul. The Bible speaks about that. The Bible says this in Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. The Bible commands believers to submit to spiritual leaders, and you can't do that if you're not part of a church. And I, I don't say this to be self-serving. You know, I, my only concern is that you be blessed, beloved. I just want you to grow in Christ. I want you to be blessed. I want you to spiritually be all that God has called you to be. And the burden that I carry is for all believers that they grow in Christ. They grow spiritually. And that's a big burden. But thank God I've got other people that help carry that. 
and we just want to see your spiritual growth. We want to see you grow in holiness. But here's another thing, another reason to have a, sp- a specific place to exercise your spiritual gift. You see, you don't just come to church and be fed and then leave and that's it. You've been given a spiritual gift and God wants you to exercise that spiritual gift in the local church. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 4.10, As every man has received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Don't insult God by saying, oh, there's nothing really I can contribute to the church. No, if you're saved, you have a gift. God's given you something, and he expects you to use it for his glory for the church. And another reason, beloved, is to evangelize the lost. Jesus gave us a commission. We are to take the gospel out into the world. We're to share Christ. I want to tell you something. This world is going to hell, beloved. The only message of salvation is through Jesus Christ. We have that message. We have the message of the gospel. And I've said this, and I'll say it to my dying day. Any person that dies and goes to hell should have to step over a believer that is on their knees pleading with them to come to Jesus Christ. We need to get out there and be passionate about sharing the saving message of the gospel with everyone. That's what God has called the church to do. And we're to strive together for, the Bible says in Philippians 1.27, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, let me just quickly go to the next point. The candidates talked about the concept and the causes, but then the candidates. And this is very easy. This is only take a minute. I answer this question, who should the church accept in the membership? And that's very simple. Anyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and has been baptized, you are a candidate for membership into the church. You're a candidate. If God's accepted you into his kingdom, why should we not accept you into this church? If you're a child of God, You've, you know that you're saved. You know that you've put your full faith in the finished work of Christ. You have obeyed the Lord in believer's baptism because baptism is to a Christian what a military uniform is to a person who just enlisted. You know, I've never enlisted in the military, but I hear that once you go down to the recruiter's office and you sign the contract, you are officially military at that point. You don't get your uniform and the haircut until later. But once you sign that contract, If you go AWOL at that point, you could be arrested because you, when you signed the contract, you were officially now part of the U.S. military. You get your uniform, and then you look like it. You know, you come into the family of God when you make your commitment to Jesus Christ, when you realize you're a sinner and you put your faith in him. You have signed the contract. You have turned to Christ. You now are a child of God. Baptism is the uniform. And that's what Jesus said, do be baptized. We believe in immersion because it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't get that out of sprinkling. That's why we're called Baptists here, because you can't sprinkle someone. When you bury someone, you don't just sprinkle dirt onto them. They're they're buried. Baptism is the Greek word that means immersion, to be buried. I know there are other churches that don't believe that. They believe in Sprinkling. One time I preached in a Methodist church. There was an ornate glass up there. I thought it was for me to drink water. I realized later I drank their baptistry dry. Like, that's, that's not a baptistry. Baptism means full immersion, not sprinkling. So when I go to other churches, I don't drink any more water. But but if you have trusted Jesus, you're a candidate. But let me give you the last thing really quickly, the commitment of church membership. A membership is a commitment to participate regularly in church gatherings for worship, for teaching, for fellowship. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. The Bible says don't forsake that assembly. Now, we understand that there are times when people are providentially hindered, and I know there are some people that would love to be here today, but they just can't come, and my heart breaks for them. And I understand that, but having said that, we are committed to being together. And we meet on Sunday morning, we meet on Sunday night, we meet on Wednesday night, we set aside that time to pray for one another. And this is a time when we exhort one another, we encourage one another, 
And that's why we need to be together. We need to help each other out. It's rough out there. And I need your encouragement, and you need the encouragement of others. And when you're not here, you can't encourage other people. Membership is a commitment to one another in the local body of Christ. You know how many one another verses there are in the Bible? Let me tell you, 59. Be at peace with one another, love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, stop passing judgment on one another, accept one another, serve one another, carry one another's burdens, be patient with one another, forgive one another, submit to one another, do not lie to one another, bear one another's burdens, admonish one another, when I could go. You know what that implies? That we are committed to one another. That we need each other in the family. And again, it, we have to be together to do that. And membership is a commitment to following the spiritual leadership that God has given. This is not blind loyalty. It's like the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And then, I don't really need to park on this because you are so very faithful, but Membership is a commitment to support the church with your finances as the Lord prospers you. As I've said before, your giving is an act of worship to Almighty God, and we have to be good stewards that we invested so that we can get the gospel out. It's all about spreading the word of God, the saving message of the gospel into the world so that God will receive honor and glory. The church is here to glorify God, to show the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ to this whole world. That's why we exist that's why we need to be committed in this one thing so that we can do that. And so let me just close by saying this. A man once wrote a book, interesting title. The title was Stop Dating the Church. And the whole thesis of the book was, again, people are unwilling to make a commitment to membership. They're just dating. Are you dating the church? Or are you willing to make that commitment for your own spiritual well-being, as well as the spiritual well-being of others. Since Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it, we, if we want to be like Christ, we need to do the same. Let's bow for prayer together. This is a spiritual discipline that I hope that you'll take to heart because you need it. I need it. The church is the institution that God has promised to bless. And so just examine your own heart in light of what Scripture teaches us. And let me just say this with heads bowed and eyes closed. You know what? There's three homes that every person ought to have. You ought to have a home home with your family. You ought to have a church home where God puts you. The Bible says the Lord adds to the church. And friend, you ought to have a heavenly home where you know you're going to heaven when you die. And that's my heart's desire for every one of you. That you have those three homes. Most importantly, that you have that heavenly home. Because I want to tell you something, friend. Death is coming to all of us. There's no discharge from that war. And I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to know that you know that you're saved. You know what? Jesus promised he would save you if you come to him, if you trust him. And would you, would you just pray that right where you are? If you're not sure, would you just pray that? Would you just say, Lord Jesus, you promised to save me if I trust you. Right now, I trust you. Save me, Lord Jesus. Forgive me for my sin. Come into my heart. And friend, if you pray that and believe, and believe that and pray it and mean it, the Bible says, him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's a loving and merciful Savior, and he loves you, and he wants to save you and give you that heavenly home. Father, will you please just bless these that are here? And Lord, do a deep spiritual work in every heart that everyone under the sound of my voice has absolute assurance that they belong to Christ, that they're part of the family of God. They're part of the body of Christ. And then, Lord, may they be unleashed to serve you in the way you've called each of us. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' holy name.